Hey everybody, this is Kevin for Crackberry.com. Hey, it's Phil from Android Central. And Derek from Pre Central or Web West Nation. I'm confused. <laughs> I'm Simon Sage from iMore. And I'm Jay from WP Central. And I'm Renee from iMore, and welcome to Mobile Nations, our cross-platform podcast where we all get together, argue, yell, and end up in a drunken group hug at the end. Kevin, it's been far too long. I, I was just thinking, when is the last time we actually recorded one of these? Like, two, before, before everyone started traveling to their trade shows and or getting sick. So we have lots of stuff to talk about, basically. I mean, it's, it's end of April. Phil might have 300 new phones and Derek might have none. <laughs> I do have a bunch of quarters in the pre-central jar, though. <laughs> like, WebOS Nation jar. Nice. No, it's the pre-central jar because I said pre-central. Mm. Uh, so um, where to begin? Uh, there, a lot of us have new devices to talk about, but before we talk about our new devices, maybe we should catch up on the people still waiting for their devices, namely the entire Crackberry Nation. Well, it's true, except I do have a lovely new Porsche design BlackBerry. I don't think I had this the last time we recorded a Mobile Nations podcast. So this is a $2,000 BlackBerry. Was and anybody saw, really waiting for that? It's like how I'm waiting for a Bentley. No, I know, exactly. You know what's really funny? Yesterday, I haven't even blogged it yet. The first accessories appeared for it. Two, $200 for a charging stand. Oh, my <laughs> God. 500 for a clock app. $99 for a leather uh, holster and like $80 <laughs> for not even a holster, just like a half shell skin thing. Are you single-handedly <laughs> keeping rim solvent? Well, Who's no, we did the math. You can, buy, you can buy like 16 shares of stock for the cost of one charging stand. You should buy the charging this. stand. Is that, holster, is that holster made out of unicorn skin or something? I, I was hoping elephant skin. Maybe there's some ivory. To, no, I'm kidding. This is, it's uh, crazy. Yeah, unicorn skin is, is probably... Well, it's what dreams are made of, apparently. It's made remember. out of the hides of former RIM employees. That's where they went. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you're, you're you know, not paying for looks in any case. Cost. The thing's ugly. Like, I, I played with it. I was just like, ah, no, it's way, way too blocky for me. Even with the cost of this beautiful piece of hardware, though, it's running the old BlackBerry 7, or I should say the current BlackBerry 7 software. But what we really want is BlackBerry 10. And uh, coming up next week, I leave on Friday for Orlando for BlackBerry World 2012. And this year, they're, <laughs> this year they're also doing a side conference, BlackBerry Jam 2012, which is basically a developer conference. <laughs> and, oh, sorry. <laughs> all geared towards BlackBerry 10 phones coming later this year. So, you know, next week we might actually have a better idea of what we're waiting for. Is but it true that there's gonna, there might be prototype hardware? So they're giving away what, the, you know, RIM is being very, very careful in what they call it. But basically, developers going to BlackBerry Jam will each receive a free BlackBerry 10 developer device. Uh, what it is, based on my understanding, is BlackBerry Colt, which was the originally rumored full touchscreen BlackBerry 10 phone. But at that point, you know, this is going back many months now, that rumored hardware was 3G. The actual first BlackBerry 10 phones would be LTE. And that hardware design got scrapped. So I think what they did is they, you know, they obviously had that phone de developed with no intent of ever putting it to market now. So they, you know, popped out a bunch of them. Those are going to be the developer devices. I think RIM's being very careful to call it, uh, you know, an alpha device uh, because they'll probably not enable any of the phone stuff. You won't be able to put in a SIM card and use it is what I'm guessing. Uh, RIM wants to be really careful, obviously, that people don't take these developer devices and start to re review them as like a first look at BlackBerry 10 phones. So it's going to be probably stripped down, you know, Playbook 2 type OS. You'll have the resolution and hardware of a, a, maybe a BB10 phone. It'll have a big screen on it, that kind of thing. Um, but not a phone, right? But still cool. And I think it's going to be kind of a cool looking thing. Uh, what's interesting, though, is we've already seen it. If you go back to CES 2012, and the Porsche uh, car that was sitting at the Cunix booth, there was this phone, like LCD display sitting on top of the dashboard in a housing. And that's what it was, right? Like I swiped that thing. I'll talk about it now. I couldn't then. But basically when I was sitting in the car getting my tour, I swiped this little thing on the dashboard and it had the Playbook OS on it. So I'm pretty sure that was just BlackBerry Colt, uh, which is now going to be the developer device people take home. So, is that why all the BlackBerry PR were jumping at you going, no. 
Oh yeah, yeah. They were there. You should have seen the looks in the eyes when I swiped it, and they were like, "Oh no!" <laughs> and it was immediate. I sat in the car and I looked at how bright that display was in my face because there was a playbook in the console, playbooks in the headrest behind me, but all I could see is this glaringly bright thing, and I'm like, "That thing's got awesome, you know, awesome pixel density to it." And I swiped it, and I'm like, "Yep, that's it." So. And then I shut up for a couple months. But. So here's my question. Dan and Jay from WP Central ran a poll, um, and they found out that a lot of people who switched to Windows Phone, the Nokia Lumia 900, had come from Android and iOS. And we'll get Jay to talk about that in a second. <laughs> but you kind of took that as an indication that there could still be a lot of, I don't know, room for rim to grow? Look, it, it's not even room. It's that people aren't as loyal as you think, you know? like. Look at the number of BlackBerry users in the world that there were, and look at, especially in the U.S. market, how many have now left BlackBerry to pick up Android and iPhones. Uh, so I was personally offended. Everybody who leaves their BlackBerry for another device, I mean, that hurts me, right? That hurts me in the heart. Uh, but it happens. And I think what that poll showed to me was, oh, you know what? It's going to happen to Phil. It's going to happen to Renee, too. Uh, people leave. People don't want to have. I mean, do you want to have the same phone for the next 40 years of your life? Maybe, maybe not. I think some people like change. And, you know, when people are in the buying zone, they want the latest and greatest at the time. They might have somebody who tells them at, in the store, pick up this phone. And, you know, I, what was what, what really shocked me is before that poll got posted, you know, I asked Dan, I said, Dan, what do you think the results will be? And he thought it would be feature phones and, you know, Android being one and two. So to see iOS up there and Android so high, I mean, between the two, that was 60% of the people. Um, I think everybody on, on the team was really surprised. So well, that's why I got Here's what's different. That's they were probably pulling people who already own smartphones, right? Well, yeah, our sure. core audience. Yeah, our core okay. audience. Yeah, so, so obviously they're going to come from smartphones. And, of course, they're going to come, you know, you're going to get more people moving from the two top platforms, period. Is there also an early adapter thing there, Phil? I mean, you see your audience buy tons and tons of the latest Android phone. Could this just be like the next no, latest phone? See, that's that's the fallacy. I, I think the majority of the buying public aren't actually buying these high-end smartphones. I mean, a lot of them are, sure. But there's a surprising number of people who buy these mid-level Android phones, you know. Um, the, My dad was, and, and the Lumia 900 isn't a high-level phone. Right. It's really it's not. A high it's, it's, well, yeah, it's a high-level experience. Well, hardware-wise, it has the same... Phone. Processor, RAM, storage, radio minus the LTE screen resolution as my pre-3 that was announced in January of last year. Yeah. And, uh, and in no way does that, that's the beauty of it. And at the, the moment, in the operating system that we've got is that that doesn't affect the experience. So people right. are going to get the high-end experience, the sort of thing that they were perhaps hoping for when they left uh, with the iPhone. And that's my opinion as to why I think iPhone is the... the top OS people have moved away from is that they get the same kind of fluid, simple experience. I was actually surprised to see so many Android people moving over because I always thought Android personally was the kind of OS that you went to if you wanted to tinker, if you wanted to have things very custom, very uh, have a lot of control over your phone. So I think the fact that what we're seeing is people picking up this really cheap phone, I mean, what is it? It's $99 over there on AT&T, free if you go mm -hmm. to the right places, and you're getting a really high-end device experience without paying for the hardware. See the, and what it's what it's showing, it, it brings back that discussion of, you know, people don't become smartphone users anymore, right? It's just phones. We're, we're hitting this point in the world where the feature phone, smartphone thing is going to die because there's no longer a smartphone user. It's just a phone user. You know, it's my mom. My mom has a BlackBerry or, you know, my other siblings use iOS and iPads and everybody's got gadgets. We all have this stuff now and people are going to move around. But it's, it's no longer a smartphone buyer buying it. It's just people buying phones, which happen to be smart. Are brands still important, Kev? Like when people see the if, if the next great phone is BlackBerry, does it matter, or they just buy the next great phone? I think there's branding. We've had this conversation, I think, before on a, a on a, f a few episodes ago, right? Where I think Apple has an extremely incredible brand and mm. um, experience around it. I mean, but between the retail stores and and everything, right? The complementary products and ecosystem, but there is a brand there. Uh, I think Android, yeah. the pro part of it is the brand, who owns the brand? Is it Android as a brand or is it Samsung, HTC, et cetera, are the brands? You and know, to so a degree, Android is the brand because as you, as you pointed out there, ecosystem is now the brand. Right. But so then, then people within comes... that have the option to say, I prefer TouchWiz over Sense. I know people who have had HTC Android phones for, what, four years now, and mm -hmm. their next phone is going to be an HTC phone because they prefer Sense over TouchWiz. Well, 
Phil, do you see loyalty to, to hardware vendors within Android on Android Central? Like, what's your take there? Or do people move from a Samsung to HTC quick? Do you have a personal preference? Do you have a favorite? I think Phil's on mute. Yeah. Phil, mute button. <laughs> He's laughing, though. He's so funny. Like, oh, uh, yes, here I am. Sorry. Hey. I <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, my, my favorite. Uh, all right, here it is. Here it is. Go tweet it out. I'm about to tell you my personal oh. favorite Android manufacturer. And it absolutely. Wow. You're on what? mute again. <laughs> He's gone again. Oh, no. Phil, audio. Audio, And Phil. that's the oh, reason why I it. like that manufacturer better than <laughs> Oh! oh. <laughs> you you, you know, son of a... Yeah. I, uh, actually, I really, really do go back I think you it. said ZTE. Um, I, I think it's probably safe to assume I'm on, I'm on an uh, HTC kick right now, but that's also because they're the only ones putting out new phones right now. Um, I used Samsung for a long, long time last year. Uh, as the Galaxy S2 phones were coming across, and the uh, Galaxy Nexus, which I'm actually playing with again today. Uh, Motorola has always kind of had a near and dear place in my heart. I used the Droid X for a long, long time. So <laughs> it, it really does bounce back and forth, and it's tough. You know, we have to try not to play favorites at AC, too. So really, my favorite phone is the one that's charged. <laughs> you know, our audio listeners are going to be so confused by that last five minutes. Uh, yeah, that's funny, though. I just tweeted out that Phil's a jerk. <laughs> I get you mean again. You retweeted it. The, the funny thing about this, and there's a little bit of backstory there, is I have keyboard shortcuts hooked up to Skype, right? And and control uh, spacebar is mute. So whenever Kevin calls me, I'm always doing something in Photoshop, and I'm zooming in Photoshop. <laughs> you know, control space click, and then Kevin can't hear me, and it, it sounds like this. And that's of course what you tell Kevin, but really you just see Kevin calling. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, uh, wait, speaking <laughs> Phil, Android Central, you guys got a big update this week. We did. We got a little uh, little sprucing up, looking better. If you haven't visited the site, everybody, you know. Even, Shame on even, you. Even BlackBerry and iOS and WebOS people, you know, check out AndroidCentral.com. And WP Central. Do it. It's so, so clean and fast and fresh. But yeah, I have new phones, too. <laughs> What'd you get? What'd you get? So I got an HTC One X. This is like the big bad boy of the line. And then the One S, which is ridiculously thin and feels awesome. The only difference, not the only difference, but the big difference is the uh, screen tech. I'm not sure if you'll be able to see it in the uh, in the video there, but oh, 720p of Super LCD 2 is just beautiful. It looks fantastic, Phil. Yeah. It, it, so how, oh, how does it compare to my Samsung Galaxy Nexus? It's better than the Nexus display. I know some people disagree, but they're wrong. Yeah, they are wrong. The sh they are. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. The, uh, the why are they wrong? Uh, why are they wrong? I hate to go the pentile route, but I think that's <laughs> what it's. Do it. Uh, I mean, look, you're going to get different you know, screen colors and temperatures on uh, different devices anyway, right? So that's part of it. Uh, in another part is the manufacturing. There is almost no air between. So you remember in displays, right, it, it's not just a piece of glass. You have a piece of glass on top and underneath. Uh, you have a digitizer, and then you have the display itself is under all that, right? So yeah. there's almost no air between the glass and the display, what's actually showing through itself. And it just looks like it's floating on top of the screen. It looks laminated like an iPhone. It really does. I keep going back and forth on whether I think the, the iPhone's as good as this or not. It kind of depends on what I'm looking at, and I've been staring at them a lot. Um, <laughs> I, I actually think the, the bigger difference there is in UIs. Because when you're looking at an iPhone, you know, uh, the springboard, right? It's just a, a big thing of apps. It's, it's just, just a launcher. Yeah, it, it's a launcher. It's boring as hell. So since you have all these widgets and, and fun things, and, and it gives you a little more to look at when you're just staring at it. It's also the size of a small tablet. Well, that <laughs> actually just sent back a, a Galaxy Note today, speaking of small How tablet. big is the screen, Phil? Is it 4.6? 4.67, 4.65, 4. Yeah. Well, have, you, have, have you formed a, uh, an opinion yet, because we're going to put Phil on the line all day today, about where the sweet spot is for sizes now on Android devices? I, I really do think it's personal. I can use a 4.7-inch phone. I've gotten used to it. Uh, I have had to change the way I do things a little bit. I can't one-hand as much. I probably personally 
like this. It's funny. We start calling these 4.3 inch phones smaller now. Um, <laughs> and, and relatively speaking, they are. But when you stop and think about it, they're still pretty huge. I think I prefer, I, I love the feel of this 1S. I can't wait for everybody to, to hold it in their hands. In fact, it's going on sale tomorrow on T-Mobile. So, um, Phil, when you, pick up, when you pick up an iPhone now, do you just feel like it's, you need a magnifying glass? Like, what's your take on <laughs> Or it? a BlackBerry phone with their tiny screens. Oh, well, yeah, I, I don't, let's not even Or an HP there. Veer. I can totally, <laughs> yeah. No, I, I can totally use an iPhone. My wife has one, and I'll pick it up and play with it and, and see what she's got going on just to see what, what app she's using and who she's texting and who's texting her. And what <laughs> 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 you'll walk away at this Madison time. Ashley, <laughs> app or Ashley Madison app or whatever it is. Yeah, Phil did a review. It was awesome. Yeah. Oh, but does she have one on her iPhone? I wonder. No, 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 she didn't have one. <laughs> We're good there. Now, it's <laughs> it's small, but it works. Like the paradigm works for Apple. I get that. It still bores me. Um, I mean, the apps are still really good, right? You can't beat the apps, but there's not. I, I need more. For me, I need more. I could use an iPhone if I had to use an iPhone. I could, but I need more. So we're having this big debate, Phil, about uh, Apple maybe going to a 16 by 9 screen, which I think Motorola's done for a while. Is there a, is there a benefit one way or the other on your Android phones that are 16 by 9 versus the I tell you what, 2 by 3? The biggest thing, and I'm surprised nobody has really, uh, really done anything about it you know, or complained about it, is it changes camera resolution on you. So you have an 8-megapixel camera, but Motorola, and I want to say maybe Samsung did it too, but I know Moto did, is it has a widescreen function on the camera right so your pictures will fill the screen but you're not necessarily taking them at the full 8 megapixel resolution uh which is fine i think you know 7.2 or 6.9 or whatever it ends up being is, is perfectly okay but uh that's one of the biggest things i don't know it no because most people don't look at at a screen and say oh well that's a 16 point you know 16 by 9 display <laughs> it's better and i you know i don't even know what these are just I bet they're not. Well, big, yeah. When you got that many damn pixels. I quite liked how Kessler could put three of his veers on one of your Galaxy Nexuses at CES. <laughs> That's true. I'm trying to think He's what so else tiny. I have. So what are you expecting, Phil? These are the first wave of 2012 ice cream sandwich Android phones. What, this is like HTC Salvo. What are Samsung and Motorola going to bring to the party? Don't really know yet. We're starting to see leaks and... I don't know if you've seen, but I spent a couple of days with HTC last week at getting a lot of background and off-the-record type stuff, and I, and I could say that. We're allowed to say that. Um, but it really gave me a greater appreciation for probably how all the manufacturers do things. And in hearing you know, design process of, of phones and software, uh, it really kind of gives me a greater understanding of how the whole thing works for everybody. So, and especially after using Sense4, and I really do enjoy Sense4. It's not perfect. Uh, there are parts about stock Android uh, stock ice cream sandwich that I still like better but I think Sense4 has done a really nice job of improving on it um, what Samsung and Motorola and, and LG and the others are going to do I don't know we've seen uh, upgrades hit and we've seen in fact HTC has had upgrades to uh, its versions of its previous versions of Sense as well but I don't know <laughs> we're gonna, come on we're Galaxy gonna... S3 I'm throwing you a softball <laughs> Yeah, well, I'll be in London next week to see what Samsung's doing. So ask me again. <laughs> Do you want? Is there a big gap that you still want? Think someone needs to fill this here? Is there a giant feature missing? Is there a UI problem that needs to be solved? I think I got to play with HTC uh, Media Link, which is kind of like their AirPlay, and it works okay. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't work anywhere near as good as as Apple's AirPlay does just yet. And in what I've got isn't final software, so I do need to say that it's close. I think. Um, that the more I get to play with something like that, the better it is, right? Like I love the idea. I think Google's going to come a lot with that. I think Wi-Fi Direct is going to be a huge thing this year. It, I think we're just in the infancy of it, but it's going to be big. Um, ecosystems are still big. I, I, there's still a lot of what Microsoft's doing that I like, and I wish I could play with some of it, and I wish they would absorb some Google stuff, and, and I wish all that would work a little better. Um, what kind? What kind of things? Well, you know, I'm still a huge Zune fan, right? Hmm. Uh, yeah, I, I like what Microsoft has been able to do with lower-end hardware and make a better experience on it. You know, if you take lower-end hardware with with Android, it's hit and miss. Some of them are really good, and some of them are just horrible. Yeah. Uh, and Apple gives you an iPhone 3GS. Go right. ahead. <laughs> it, it, but Microsoft's been pretty consistent and, and able to push that out, uh, and that's good. That's interesting. It's been, it's been interesting, sorry, to, to see what Nokia's done just in the past couple of weeks. They had the... Uh, 
the weird network APN thing where, where people's data was just completely dropping off. And it was interesting to see their response to that. That was only interesting, though, because of the well. beta test thing, Jay. I mean, like, I don't think if that beta test campaign had aired first, people would have given them a hard time. But coming <laughs> yeah. off the beta test campaign and then having a problem made it funny. Yes, it was. And we can't, I can't argue with that in the slightest bit because I laughed as soon as I read the headline. Um, what, what we have to give them credit for, though, is the fact that they turned it around in a week. Uh, I think it was. You know, a week later, there was a patch out. All the phones were fixed and everyone was fine. And if you wanted to, you could take it back. And let's also not forget that Nokia said, OK, if you had this problem, in fact, even if you didn't have this problem, we'll give you $100 on your, uh, on your AT&T bill. So make it, effectively making the phone free. Um, so they couldn't have done it any better. And I think part of that is, as you've correctly identified, because uh, if there'd been a, a bigger problem, if they hadn't dealt with it quickly, they would have been ridiculed for life regarding the uh, beta test ad. Uh, we're still going to do it for life. <laughs> yeah, I know you will, but uh, I think anyone who's anyone who's looking at it, you know, from a purely objective point of view, will say, "Yeah, they did all right." Um, but well, no, they were they, spectacular. That, uh, I mean, the, uh, Apple begrudgingly gave you a free bumper. Uh, Nokia did everything told you immediately. You it wrong. Yeah, yeah. And Nokia I mean, turned the update around quicker than they said they would too. They were going to push it out on Monday, and they pushed it on Friday. Well, yeah. they had no choice but to push that out as, as soon as it was done. Well, that's yeah. something you <laughs> exactly get that right. out. My phone doesn't work. Well, we'll we'll get that to you. Bob. Uh, they, the phone Monday, kind of worked. It just it, it was just not working with the network. If you set down the <laughs> oh oh, I, I know what, I'm not going to play about with it. The phone wasn't working as it was supposed to work, but it was it was fixed. And uh, you could you can call one bug out of beta. You know, there's plenty of bugs when things go out into the wild. Um, but yeah, the, the sort of smartphone beta test thing. It was the whole. It was an interesting angle to take, and Nokia have to be aggressive with their marketing, especially in the US, where they've run out mm -hmm. of of all goodwill pretty much, apart from what people remember back in the old days. Uh, so it was kind of a case of we've got to go in, we've got to attack the competition. But if you're going to run with that marketing campaign, you have to be absolutely certain that your device is going to live up to it, absolute expectations on day one. And for the most part, it does. It's just, as you say, it was really funny to see that. Um, and the fact they turned around in a week means we don't have to worry about it too much in terms of backlash from consumers. Um, that Yeah, it was sort of a, a dark day for Windows Phone users to say, hey, look, new device. Oh, Pick it up in a week. It's fine. I want to get back to the Lumia in a second, but I just want to go to Kevin quickly because I want to pick up on what Phil said. Phil was talking more and more about ecosystems, Kev, but there was this whole thing in BlackBerry about how they want to focus and focus on their strengths and maybe making a music product wasn't as important as it should have been. <laughs> do you think there's tension between trying to do everything and trying to do some things well? It might depend where you are in the marketplace right now. I mean, Rim, Rim was trying to do everything at a point where you know, their platform, the base OS, the base everything wasn't done well enough yet, right? So I think there's a difference between capabilities and experience. I think one of RIM's fundamental flaws on BlackBerry OS is they kept adding a lot of capabilities to the platform over a lot of years, but those capabilities didn't necessarily come with a good experience for the end user. And people wised up, people didn't wise up to that for a long time. And then, you know, Apple made them wise up to it, and then Rim was caught in the back foot, realizing everything had to get revamped. Now they're in this catch-up game where they can't do everything. They have limited resources. The cash flow is slowing down. They need to you know, sell the hardware they can, and they need to get new products to market, and that's where their, all their attention needs to go. If they can succeed in working with third-party partners to pull in a lot of these uh, you know, on-the-side things, I think that's fine for now. But then at some point, if you want to control the end-to-end -end user experience as well as you can, you become more of an Apple where you want to, you know, that's the utopia of building a great user experience through. So, I don't so, know. That's kind, of, that's kind of a roundabout messy way, right? But I think that makes sense. It's Well, it's interesting the, because, Dan, um, sorry, Jay, you're, Microsoft is almost clawing for that third position right beside RIM at this point. But absolutely. because they're Microsoft, they have so much stuff already in place. Yeah, a lot of it, it for them. It's less about uh, it's less about trying to branch out into these areas. It's more about consolidating all these services under under one brand name, and we're seeing that a lot with Windows 8 already. Sort of all the live uh, mantras being thrown out almost, and we're just going back to uh, making things as simple as possible. So Zoom is probably going to disappear as a name, and it'll just become uh, either live music or Windows <laughs> Music. Uh, the same with videos on that line. And the same with all the pictures. It'll just all come back to trying to make things unified as Windows services. Uh, which is, is smart because, as you say, it, that brings across the message of having one great set of services that are going to work really well together. Um, but, yeah, it's already in place for Microsoft, and it's just kind of now a case of driving that home into a, having the right hardware and bringing the user experience of the software into, into play, um, which I think they're doing. 
So that brings us biased. really nicely back to the Lumia 900, which I, I had the chance to try at CES, and it feels like mm. it's not made from a material that originates on Earth. <laughs> yes, polycarbonate is, of course, the the the, the, the way the uh, Nokia would like me to describe it. Um, is that what uh, James Cameron is mining from asteroids? It's the stuff <laughs> McDonald's milkshakes is made out of, I think. <laughs> it's actually what the uh, One X is, by the way, as well. It's, it's polycarbonate. Yeah, and it's a good way of going. I think the One X has got a similar uh, story in that it's a sort of unibody single piece. Um, but yeah, Nokia have made a lot of smart design decisions. I haven't got a 900 here because they haven't released it over in the UK. I do have, of course, its baby brother, the 800. In cyan, uh, and of course. In cyan, of course, because it's it's the color to go for, not the white one, as uh, as somebody here would have you believe. Um, well, they're saying that the white one is sold out in the US, so clearly a lot Get of people do like one. it. Get the white one. Get the white one. That's what I said. Dan got the white one. It's, yeah. Dan got the white. Well, Dan has a Cyan one as well. Dan has all of them. <laughs> he Dan has all the Nokia. That's why they're sold out. Dan has all the Windows phones that have ever been. No, <laughs> it's a it's a superb phone, and Dan did a fantastic review of it. If you haven't already read it, and you're thinking about uh, looking at picking up a Windows phone, um, for me right now, I think the Nokia Lumia series is the best Windows phone experience you can get. Uh, and that's just because of what Nokia are bringing out for their, uh, for their apps, for the different services that they're bringing out and the support that they're bringing to the platform. Uh, they have to make this work. Nokia absolutely has to make this work and they will throw all their weight behind it until it does work, until it's for them the best phone they can possibly make. Um, but there are a couple of disappointments uh, that we should bring out. Um, the camera, as we basically spoke about for i think what felt like about 10 15 minutes on the last wp central podcast is not as good as some of the competition for windows phone um and the dan has a thing about vibrating uh, so for dan the vibrating rattles too much which sounds like the, the the most bizarre problem in the world but dan insists that it is a problem so um, i have a question for both you and phil because this drives me nuts I like the idea of the Galaxy Nexus, but the camera is not as good as, for example, the HTC mm. One. The Lumia 900 looks fantastic, but the camera is not as good as, like, the Titan. Why isn't it's, there it's that one as... phone to rule them all? Well, because if that was the case, then none of the other competition would be able to do, would it? You have to have the choice. You have to be able to prioritize. <laughs> we can't just make everything perfect. So it's on purpose. And Microsoft's like, you can't. You can have the no. great phone, but not the great camera. And Google's like, <laughs> I, all right, it, Samsung. Is it, this is Nokia, the company that put out a 41 megapixel smartphone. Yeah. Well, and it's coming. their flagship Windows phone has a eh, camera <laughs> in it. It's no, it's an eight megapixel. It's a Carl Zeiss lens, but that name doesn't mean anything really. It, the the only thing that it doesn't do particularly well is the low light situation, because for some reason that none of us quite understand, they didn't put a backlight sensor in it. Um, yeah, that, why? Okay, um, okay, just wait. You can't ask uh, me that question because I don't know. <laughs> my two thousand dollar BlackBerry here. <laughs> doesn't have autofocus and it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> it, and it does, it does. It depends on what you want to use your phone for. I mean, I like taking the occasional snappy picture, but really I want a good phone experience. I want a good data experience. Um, the camera's not that important to me. Uh, it just, you know, it's giving people choice. And we'd all hate it if we had no choice, right? What would we have to talk about? Now, I would like to have a... See, Phil, what's the answer to that? Why can't I have a Galaxy Nexus with the best camera in the world? Uh, because they couldn't get the bigger module into that form factor. Wow. I hate when physics interrupts me. Sorry. But, uh, <laughs> the One S and the y, One X are really good, and HTC has a, a dedicated processor just for these. I, I don't know if other cameras do this, but the thing on these are they shoot in the raw, and then, uh, and then uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, then process everything on the device itself. The other thing, and I didn't know this was a thing. I'm not a camera guy, so I'm learning a lot of this as I go along. Uh, but in the meetings I was in last week, they were pushing not so much megapixels, but aperture. And yep. It's got an F2.0. Uh, and pixel size. So yep. I didn't know that was a big thing. But the pixel yep. size on the sensor is 1.4 microns. A lot of companies decided to go for a megapixel race by simply chopping up the sensor into more and more pixels. But that makes them incredibly small, so they capture very little light, and they create really crappy, noisy photos. Yeah. And what you really want is a giant-ass, huge... Like Everyone makes fun of Steve Jobs, but he was like, we're going to capture all the photons! Um, and that's really what you want, is to capture as much light as you can and get as good a picture as you can, regardless of the megapixels. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it, it all comes back to spec race, doesn't it, as to what specs are important to you. And, and I think, you know, if, if we were talking Android world, then specs would be the most important thing I could tell you about the phone. Uh, because it's all about having the, the latest and greatest possible specifications to run the Android platform. Um, but I think, it come, I think there are a few key areas where I think I agree with you. It, we should have 
a perfect phone. We should have a perfect camera phone that has a great touch screen, a good quality screen, and just has a, a great experience below it. I don't really care what the processor is inside it, as long as I never see it lag or start stuttering around. Right. That shouldn't matter to the average user. Um, well, and actually, and, and we're we're going through this weird thing in Android right now, where you have quad core devices coming out, and then uh, yeah. Tegra three, and then dual core Qualcomm stuff, and everyone, well, quad core's got to be better. It's more, and your it, wife will exactly. Love it. <laughs> You're yeah, ridiculous. <laughs> I haven't got a quad core processor in my PC yet. I just didn't see the point of it. So why yeah. do I want it in my phone? Well, Kevin, you made you raised a point a while ago that you think the companies sometimes deliberately hold back in order to have a better product to release next time. Like they sort of trickle down their changes and spoon feed them to us. Yeah, mm. depending on depending on the position, I think that's what Apple does, being kind of the one everybody else is catching up to, uh, and then other companies do it because they just want to get to market fast, so they lock it down and pump it out as quick as they can. And if it's going to delay sales by two months, they don't. They'll just put something out with less features to get it out and then upgrade it two months later. So it, it goes both ways. So, Simon, oh. if you're looking at the, the stage right now and you have, you know, iOS, they say it's outselling almost all competing phones on major U.S. networks. You have Android, which by unit share is just growing every day. You have BlackBerry and Windows Phone fighting. You know, you, you can almost see them fist fighting for the third position place. As a consumer, how do you start weighing these? Well, I, I think for a lot of average consumers, they're going to be pretty interchangeable. You know, it's 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 just going to be a matter of which carrier they have a preference towards and what they're selling, right? Um, I mean, it, it, in the case of the the Lumia, uh, it's it's a good pick for a lot of people because it's pretty cheap compared to a lot of the other smartphones out there, and it does more or less what what people want: web browsing, email, and a couple of apps, right? Um, mm -hmm. I think that. When you take a look at people who are earlier adopters and have been kind of steeped in smartphones for a little while, they'll have a bigger preference based on previous experience. But uh, I, I think most people picking up their first smartphone, it's it's simply what's on the shelf and what the, sale, what the salesman is pushing at them. I don't think they necessarily care about you know spec wars or, or, or anything like that. So it's yeah, a smart thing. You're absolutely spot paying. on. It's going to be either a recommendation from a friend, the design of the phone, the experience when they hold it, and whatever the salesman is pushing. That's the, the average. That's what they're looking at. Yeah, so, and what it really comes back to is the smartphone hierarchy of needs, which nobody pays attention to. They just their their priorities are all messed up. Actually, <laughs> it's funny. I've I've got uh, Sean Cooper from Engadget on on my BBM right now. He. Uh, after years of not, you know, using a BlackBerry, now he picked one up again. He got a Bolt 9900, uh, and he's giving it a go, right? Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, just just kind of enter the experience, knowing there's going to be things right now you can't do with it that you know BlackBerry 10 is kind of addressing, and just use it as a great communication tool. And you know, after first day, he had a little issues. He doesn't like the Gmail experience on it too much. But then today, he said, you know, using this phone just makes me realize that every touchscreen keyboard is crap, <laughs> and it's true. Yeah. You know, every touchscreen keyboard is crap compared to picking up a Bold 9900. So what are your priorities? You know, mm. and you need two devices right now to actually do everything best in class. So. Yeah, or you go on the route of the landscape uh, QWERTY slider, which never really took off that well. Yeah, it's, there's yeah. still a perfect well, slider the out one there of those to be done. Announced. Or the portrait QWERTY slider, which Derek keeps mm. holding up. I'm yeah. not a fan of portrait QWERTY sliders. They're too big. I do admit, the, the actual design of my old Nokia <coughs> N97, I love that. The, the flip out and use the keyboard there. It was just the rest of the phone was rubbish. So, but the little keyboard was wicked. Jay, how important is it that AT&T is making the Lumia 900 a hero phone and Verizon just said they're going to you know, get, get into bed with, with Windows phone? Is that hedging against Android? Is that just it's, them wanting more choice? It's massively important. It's massively important, and it's not just because it's important for Windows phone, but it's important for the market in general. Um, so AT and T are pushing this as their hero device, not only because it's a third uh, ecosystem and it would it encourages the whole pricing of every phone in the world ever to come down, uh, but also because it gets people onto their brand new LTE network, which I don't think we've mentioned yet, but is really fast for now uh, until people all get on it. Um, where you can so that's get it? <laughs> where, yeah, where you can get it. Obviously, I can't speak of LTE. We don't even know what it is over here in in London, but uh, it's coming. Out in three told. years. Yeah, in three years. But just remember, we had 3G first. <laughs> um, but it's, yeah, it's so important because eight, you think of all these other phones, and in the day, if one phone becomes too popular, it's like any market, we end up with a saturated market where it's monopolized by one phone, one device, and that they have all the power. Uh, a strong three 
three horse race competition. Sorry, Blackberry. Uh, four horse race, <laughs> if you want to include the Blackberries. I know a lot of people have them, so I'll say four horse race. Uh, is really good for the market and it means that it encourages it encourages developers to work across all platforms it gives us plenty to do uh, it encourages users to pick and try and have that choice and have that decision uh, and i think at&t pushing a device which has a bit of a wow factor to its design as you said it doesn't quite feel it's made of this world uh, is the right decision so i want to bring derek into this because uh, not only because he's snarky but because he has <laughs> <laughs> he has lived through a process which BlackBerry and Windows Phone are dangling precipitously near. And I hate making oh. you that guy, Derek, but I mean, you I'm went through guy. Palm with Sprint. You went through like a, a trial launch with AT&T and Verizon. Mm -hmm. what, what are the priorities now for these companies? Focus. Uh, Microsoft and Nokia are doing a very good job of focusing. Uh, RIM, I, I'm not sure that they're focused they're doing a good job of focusing on what they really need to improve or that they even know what really needs to be improved. Uh, you know, they're building BlackBerry 10 based off of the Playbook OS, but Playbook didn't sell well. Until... Ah, that's the worst thing to ever say. Don't... <laughs> Okay, keep did going. It, did it sell well, or did it sell well once it was massively discounted? No, but they're not building BlackBerry 10 off the Playbook platform. I mean, it's the QNX it's platform QNX. that's a platform... They knew to release a phone, it's like a two-year development cycle for them, and the playbook was just an intermediary beta test. It was never designed as like a final product, you know? Like it was released. Then why release it? Get good feedback. Then it just makes you look bad, and they meantime. lost millions I agree. and millions no, of dollars. No, I agree. It made them look it. bad. They didn't get the work done fast enough. But it's not that they're mm -hmm. basing it on the playbook. That statement, I can't let you say. He won't cut into that. Yeah. So ca carry on. Sorry. All right. Fine. Uh, they are... The, the base of BlackBerry 10 is the same base software that they used in the playbook. It's the same UI, if I'm not mistaken. Mm, same basic UI yet. is what we're assuming. No, it's changing. Changing? Okay. Changing. They've learned some lessons there. That's good. Uh, and I, you know, they're, they're sort of going to have to go through this dark period of silence. You know, we've gone through that for three years with WebOS, uh, where things are going to be uncertain. We just have to hope that RIM has enough money in the bank to make it through to the end where they're actually putting out devices that the general consumer finds desirable. Uh, hmm. They need to move Windows out of the niche phone. market, perhaps. Say what? They need to move out of the niche market, perhaps. Yeah. yeah. Uh, as much as I love uh, QWERTY, or look, QWERTY keyboards, I think the Bold 9900 is a fantastic hardware device. Hmm. That sort of, you know, people looking at it and seeing, what, there are 35, 40 buttons on the face of this device, that, that scares people now. <laughs> they're used yeah. to iPhones, and they're used to Droids, and they're used to Windows. We're getting used to Windows phones that have maybe one button on the device. Uh, one, two, three, four, four. On the front of the device. Oh, oh none. <laughs> yeah, none. You have, a, you have three capacitive buttons. Kevin yeah, has 107. Or three if you get a Lumia 710. But. Right. Uh, but th that's very simple, whereas you look at a BlackBerry and it looks complicated. 42 buttons. A... 42. <laughs> nice. She answered everything. <laughs> but you have a shift key, so it's like having 84. Ooh. Joke. And a function key. Yeah. Oh, my. That's <laughs> like so hundreds high. and hundreds of buttons. But yeah, people look at that and it's complicated. It's it's imposing. The chat room is saying the alphabet is not complicated. <laughs> yeah, there. Right. You look at an iPhone, it's not complicated. It's not imposing it, unless you get the black one and it looks like the obelisk from 2001. Um, I don't know. An iPhone with lots of grids of icons, when you get to that stage where it gets there's too much going on, I, don't, I get it confused. There's maybe too much going on, but it's very simple still. Mm -hmm. It's just you have 16 icons. And then the four on the bottom, and you just swipe. You can search if you so desire. Uh, Windows Phone, if you really, if you don't know what you're doing, can get very confusing. You have things putting live tiles on there, and you just have this list of live tiles. If you don't know how to move these around or how to manage them, then you start getting a cluttered mess. Same thing had happened with Android. I mean, well, you can't do that with WebOS because there's not much customization available because <laughs> they want you to use cards. Um, <laughs> But you know, there's the trend has been towards simplification, and that's what they're going for. I, I would believe that's what they're going to be doing with BB10. Uh, you know, we've seen those rumored or the spy shotted uh, devices, like the one that's the the Porsche design version Colt, 
or just the Colt itself. It's a very simple device. Um, mm. And we, it all, they have to play their cards exactly right or else, you know, in three years, RIM is going to be bought out for their patents. I think three years. <laughs> I, I honestly think they either make it with BB-10 or I don't know what happens. I don't think it's yeah. three years of flailing well, they, there. They may make it with BB-10. It's going to take a while to tell whether they make it with BB-10. I don't think they're going to pull a Leo Apotec and cancel it after 49 days. My, uh, so they're going to give it a fighting chance. It may take one or two years. You know, BB-10's coming out end of the year. Uh, uh, yeah, for, fall, end of the year. Yeah. And it can't come out... Uh, it has to be able to compete right now with, by that point, iOS 6 so, and Android 4 or maybe and, and 4 or 4.5. Jelly Bean or, or Klondike Bar. So Derek, right. the question and I have that even that open web OS is going to have is going forward. We're putting out this updated version of the OS, but how does it compete with what's coming up or even what's out on the market? Skating now? to where the puck's going to be. But, exactly. but here's my bigger question, Derek, is do carriers sure. even give it a chance to compete? Because BB-10 could be great, but if, if the BlackBerry brand, especially in the U.S. right now, is so kind of tarnished, mm. you know, where it's it's getting made fun of almost in the U.S., if you're Verizon or AT&T, do you even push it? Uh, if you're Timo, do you give it a chance to compete, even if it's good? Even if it's better, if even it's, if it's not quite as good? If it's or better, just, absolutely. If it's not quite as good, No. And they didn't give the Palm Pre uh, Plus a chance on Verizon because it wasn't as fantastically. It was, it, you know, the Droid had just launched on Verizon, um, and it, the Pre had launched on Sprint already, and it was it did okay. Pre Plus is a Pre with more RAM, good thing, but it's still the Pre. Uh, the difference is surely that BlackBerry has the money to actually pay the carriers to push it. Well, are they willing to pay that? Uh, that's are a whole different question. Willing to pay that. Well, Microsoft so has what, tons of Nokia, business, and they pay it. And yeah, RIM has Nokia only one. Has, Nokia has been... They, they've been given that second chance by AT&T. Uh, mm. Verizon's making uh, noise about giving Microsoft that second chance after years of disappointment at the hands of Windows Mobile. They didn't give it a second chance. They put out a HTC trophy and then called it a day. Well, they said recently they're making googly eyes at it again. Yeah. yeah. Ver Verizon are just Verizon are like the kind of carrier they're like a girlfriend that just plays you hot and cold constantly. It's like, oh, I like you. Oh, I don't like you anymore. Oh, but when but when Verizon it's, like mind. You, it's really good for you. <laughs> Verizon put Android on the map. True, very true. So Before I wanna... that, there was the Sprint Hero and the T-Mobile G1 and maybe a handful of other devices. That G1 and they was did awesome. Okay, and then Verizon put all of their muscle behind the Droid. And the droid mm -hmm. line, and it did. It's done fantastically well since. Now they may have done well on AT and T or Sprint or T Mobile, um, <laughs> but Verizon has that muscle. On a regional it, carrier, they would have done great. Oh yeah, they would have done fantastic. Verizon's <laughs> got, going gangbusters on Cincinnati Bell. <laughs> uh, I've got a question. I, I just yeah. this, this is like a thinking out loud, kind of on the obviously BlackBerry this. thing because that's what I talked to about. <laughs> Let, let's assume. BlackBerry 10 for a second is is good, but it's got some gaps at launch. You know, it's not going to have all the apps. There might be some things to finish. It might do some things really unique, and some things not as well. No angry. And let's say and let's say it doesn't get <laughs> pick up in carrier pickup in the U.S. Like or very minimal. You know, somebody picks it up, and nobody puts it it's on picked the hero up, but no, it's never advertised, store. and it just sits on the shelves. Just kind of sits there, right? There's a lot of markets around the world that are still selling BlackBerry 7 phones, right? And for those markets. You know, if they get BlackBerry 10, it won't be, it'll be a good experience, right? It'll be good. The people who like BlackBerry still will love BlackBerry 10. Is that enough to keep RIM going for a foreseeable period of time? Because I kind of said two minutes ago, well, they might not have that three years. But now I'm thinking maybe they do, even without the US, if they can get enough international love where the brand's still strong. Do you know if it's going to be premium only, Kevin, or is it going to be all tiers of devices? It's going to start premium, but I think very quickly they'll have to move it. Um, down the line to lower end also because if it's They'll premium and launch it's going to have to be in markets where people can afford and are willing to sure. spend money on premium here's handsets. a question uh say blackberry right now is doing well overseas right and, and not as well as they were but it's they're doing better than north america they're, they're doing okay so overseas they're doing better than they are in north america yeah. in and they're countries. still losing money 
No, they're, they're still not making, losing money. They're, they're just they're not making, making as much. Yeah, yeah, oh, they're, they're not losing money. That's hard. the thing. This isn't Palm, right? They're they're <laughs> making money. They just don't. Palm didn't have a lot of money to start with. Yeah. Uh, so Rim is still making money, yeah. but nowhere near as much as they were before. Nokia had a huge presence overseas, still does, and they still sell oodles of Symbian phones. Yeah, and well, they're still they losing money. But low cost lots Android, and See, low cost they... Android is the one killing them now. So I, I, I want to pivot yeah. for a second and bring Phil back into this because I had to put up with uh, three or four months ago, maybe six months ago, I had to put up with all this nonsense about iPhone being dead in the water. Um, and now because really? that's gone through a news cycle, Phil has to put up with all this nonsense about Android being dead in the water. <laughs> uh, I, I, next week is going to be Windows Phone, so you'll get your chance, Jay. Uh, okay. But I, there, there's interesting things here. Like we're seeing that because Apple puts out one phone a year, it sells really well when that phone comes out. And when it doesn't, come out you know android phones sell really well uh there's all this talk phil about android being forked and you know or and maybe someone else succeeding with android maybe an amazon more than google is succeeding with it um do you think there there could be a world where the number one maybe two and three four are all forks of android and that starts to suck all the air out of the space no i think it inflates the space even more you think it I mean, it. Which part of all the top five devices all run Android is confusing to people. I don't get it. <laughs> so, I mean, it, it goes back to the old, well, I mean, it goes back to the old Windows CE days, right? Like, it never took off for a number of reasons, mainly that it kind of sucked. Uh, and, and we're going to see, I guess, Microsoft try it again with Windows RT, or is that just for tablets? Windows, uh, no, RT, Windows, is Windows RT is just for ARM devices. devices. Yeah. Just for ARM, that's right. Don't, don't get me started on Windows. Yet. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> but no, I mean. Get me started on Windows. I've, I've said this for I don't know how long. I mean, Android is an embedded operating system. Amazon has done exactly, exactly what you're supposed to do with it. It's it's brilliant the way they've done it. It's genius. And, yes, it's a total end run around uh, Google. And that's fine. That's great. That's very, very good for the ecosystem, I think. Now, now here's a question. A this Amazon has done with Android what Android was supposed to do. Has Amazon done with Android what Google wants them to do with Android now? Nice. That I'm the wrong person to ask. I don't know. And I would be – look, I would be really curious to see what people inside Google are saying about what Amazon has done. I hope. I hope they've taken a step back and looked and said, you know what? They did pretty good. They did some really interesting things, especially in the tablet space, right? I mean, mm -hmm. uh, and they jump-started the, the app system like you wouldn't believe, although – I say that um, the AC Forums app that we have now is, you know, it's a Tap Talk app, and it has, it might have 200 downloads on Amazon. I don't mind giving numbers for that. It's like none compared to the, uh, to the uh, traditional Google Play Store. So we'll see. But I didn't think Amazon would do nearly as well as it has. And if you look at the free app of the day thing and the exclusives they done, remember uh, Angry Birds was first on Amazon. Yeah. Yeah, uh, for Android. So yeah, they've done remarkably well, and you know, hats off to them. But no, I, I don't think it's a bad thing that people are able to take the OS and do things with it. That's awesome. I mean, that's the way it should be. Is yeah. the Nook Touch? You know, is is that making the ecosystem worse? I don't think so. But that's running Android. It's making a new ecosystem to a degree. Yeah. Yes, yes, the developers can mm -hmm. can put out for all sorts of different areas, but it's a whole new ecosystem that they just have to keep alive themselves. All it yeah. does is take away from Google's search ratings. What exactly. about what RIM's doing with, uh, with the Playbook and Android apps? I mean, they're just really aggressively poaching Android developers, basically. You know, uh, I don't know if that's necessarily a bad thing. I mean, RIM's just try trying to build up their own app ecosystem. But is that legitimate? Is it, is it going to help them at all? It's... Is it going to help the developers, Google, or RIM? Yes. Well, yeah. <laughs> Any of the above, yeah. Everybody. Yeah, there's, there's Angry Birds in the Playbook. Everybody wins. I don't know that it's helping RIM at all. No, me neither. Because, you know, then there are people are just going to make ports to Android apps and you're running Android apps on a playbook, in which case you might as well just get an Android tablet. RIM need, uh, how many different operating or app environments are available on the playbook? All of There's, them. Yeah, that's the problem. All of them. On an iPad, you can run Objective-C and web apps. On an Android device, you can run Java and web apps. On a Windows phone, you can run Windows phone. <laughs> on Whatever Jay my, codes in today. Yeah. On C sharp. A, C sharp. On <laughs> a touchpad, you can run 
Mojo and Enyo, both HP frameworks and web apps. On a BlackBerry, you can run... Uh, J2ME. 2ME, you can run <laughs> Android, you can run web apps, you can run whatever the programming environment is. The actual official SDK environment is for the playbook. I don't know. But that's only a problem if it doesn't work. I mean, if, if it gets tons right. of apps and Kevin can sit there with his playbook and not have to worry about finding the app he wants, then it helps for him. And yeah, Rim should have been putting... I, I, I firmly believe that Rim should have been putting more emphasis on fixing, on getting people onto that SDK than saying, come port your Android app over and it'll just run in an Android environment. Absolutely yeah, right. And I mean, th and th th that was kind of the, their angle initially too, was that all of these kind of low-hanging fruit for developers and other ecosystems, uh, it would be low-hanging fruit to just kind of hop into Playbook just to test the waters. And if it's usually su successful, Rim would be there to say, okay, here's the NDK, go nuts. But all of the developers that I've talked to, they're just throwing it out there because they, they, they might as well, but very few are, are willing to go all out and, uh, and, and rewrite their entire app for, for, yeah. for the Playbook NDK. And actually, that will depend on how easy it is and how good their developer tools are. I mean, yes, in the case of Windows Phone, yes, we've only got one uh, language or two languages that you can develop in, but it's really simple to do so. It's really well structured. I remember the last time I tried to write a J2ME app for sort of something in the regions of BlackBerry, and I, I think I was pulling out most of my hair at that point. It's it, Part of it is down to how easy it is for the developers. And just throwing the kitchen sink at it and saying, yeah, you can develop whatever you like isn't necessarily the best way to go. It won't create a good experience. It'll just create compatibility. I'd argue that, you know, we have all these fantastic platforms and we still don't have a good app ecosystem anywhere. I mean, iOS is continually pushing everything to the lowest price point possible as a race to the bottom. They have no upgrade pricing. Developers are disincentivized from making better apps over time because they don't get paid for them. Uh, on Android, you still have tons of issues with monetization. You have issues with difference of platforms. WebOS was always, you know, the HTML is a high-level language and the hardware is not there to make it run quickly. BlackBerry mm -hmm. had J2ME, now they have too many options. If I'm just a user looking at my phone, none of these companies have got it right yet. And to me, the amount of brains and money and technology behind this, and none of them have properly nailed it yet, is kind of stupefying. How it's do a very you properly thing nail to get it? Right. Yeah. You, you take the, I mean, you, it's the same thing as a phone. I can't get a phone that's great with a great camera. I, I, like Apple really nailed having tons of apps, but what they allow developers to do is highly restricted to the point that developers, it's almost like an Atari thing where they're going to start burying ET cartridges one day. Uh, they're just, they're just <laughs> not, it's not friendly enough for developers. And, you know, Android, you can do almost everything, but it's, it, it, the monetization options aren't there for enough developers yet um, to really, people are still developing for iOS first and what? Windows for, Instagram for a billion dollars isn't enough of a... But, that, but that's the lottery. I mean, that's not working every day. That's winning the lottery. And that's, and that's, that, an that's not a business that's plan. Enough. That's one that, that, of, what, 600,000 apps? Yeah. I, I, it's just, there's, if we could take, like, uh, demos, you know, from, from Windows Phone, if we could take refunds, if we could take upgrades, if you could put these together into one comprehensive, user-friendly app model, it'd be so much better. But we're still almost on these little silos all the time. Um, and one of the things I've seen with, uh, especially with iOS, is it's very hard for developers to get discovered. I, uh, you covered just this past week or, or past two weeks on uh, iMore, Pains and Doc by Inglorious Apps. Uh, he's a former or still current WebOS developer, but he made these apps for uh, iPad and iPhone as well. And he would notice that he was, you put something out on the uh, WebOS app catalog, it's immediately noticed because there's yeah. not a whole lot there. You put something out on uh, iOS in the App Store, unless somebody is waiting for that app, it gets pushed down the list instantly. Well, it's the same reason Crackberry will blog a higher percentage of Playbook apps than will ever blog you know, percentage of iOS apps. There's mm -hmm. just way too many. Um, I want to tangent into the, 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 the last new device we haven't spoken about yet, and I know some of you have opinions on it, ranging from Kevin's great editorial on it to <laughs> Phil's uh, AC rev podcast review. Um, the iPad 3, it is... It's not I think, called the iPad 3. Come on, get that right. It's the iPad 3. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what am I supposed to call it? The new iPad? How, uh, it's not That's new anymore. It's been it. out for several months. It's hopes, uh, You know what makes me really bad? Sure? 
It only makes me really mad is I wanted Rim to call BlackBerry 10 the new BlackBerry, and now they can't because Apple called it the new. Why? Samsung's <laughs> going to call it the new Galaxy Nexus or whatever. I mean, this is open season now. Uh, so the thing that's interesting from an Apple point of view is it's not faster, it's not thinner, it's not lighter. I mean, this is this is completely against Apple trends. It has a Retina display, which is quite, frankly, stupefyingly good. Um, awesome. Yeah, and it's selling really well in a tablet space where not a lot of players are still selling well. But mm -hmm. it's sort of, if you have an iPad 2, there's absolutely no reason to get it. If you have an iPad, an original iPad, no iPad, or if you just like new technology, maybe you'll like it. But Apple is making a ton of money selling one device a year in each category. Um, and what does that mean for the greater market? Everyone else is selling tons of different devices, splitting market share, splitting platform. Uh, are these two viable models, or is Apple just figured out a way to cherry pick the wealthiest segment um, and leave sort of what's left for everybody else? You remember when I let off on my ramble about what RIM needs to do to avoid becoming WebOS version two? Yes. Yes. Focus. Apple is focused. They put out one phone, they put out one tablet, and they spend all the rest of the year working on the next one. They aren't putting out. 16 different devices like Samsung or HTC will do. They don't feel the need to conquer the low end and the high end. If they put out one device and price it well, they can conquer everything. And we have and Apple earnings in about half an hour to show us how much they... they <laughs> Kevin, I always go to you for the business yeah. model stuff. I mean, this is yeah. obviously working for Apple. Is this a sustainable model for Apple? Could the iPad 4 be you know, slightly thicker, slightly heavier? Um, and maybe, I don't know what else they could put into it. An even better camera. Yeah, an even better camera. A Carl sustainable, it, it can be sustainable for quite a while. And I mean, I mean, a big thing is simply there's a lot of people in the world. When, when Apple gives you these ma monstrous numbers and even the number of iPhone users and iPad owners, it's this. It's tidy compared to the population of the world, right? Mm -hmm. it's, there's still billions of people left to buy these things. You know, even, you know, pick your countries and exclude parts of the world, et cetera. There's still a massive market share of people who don't own smartphones and iOS devices who want them. Uh, things like tablets, you know, might not be things people run out and buy because the people who do that already have it, but birthdays and Christmas presents, they're the top of the list. Yeah. And there's a lot of room room for growth there. So it, it's sustainable for a long time. And then as you that taps out, you're going to have people updating. So it, they've got a lot of room to grow still, you know, and, and it's kind of astronomical when you look at their stock price and even their stock now, it, it got hammered a little bit there yeah. because... There's, you know, humans in general, I think there's this kind of sticking point. And actually, we should do a Stock Talk podcast because I think what's happening is uh, Facebook's going public soon. So a lot of people know Apple's stock is crazy high. And, you know, app, you know Facebook, regardless of what it'll IPO at, it'll probably shoot up the same day, you know, from 30 bucks to 80 bucks. It'll drop and then it'll probably run up to 200 before something happens. You know, if you're a shareholder, you'd probably start selling off some Apple stock, which is super high. Yeah, you'll take put it your into profit. Facebook, take your profit, put it into Facebook for a year or two, try to ride that up. But I think like over the next year or so, Apple's probably going to keep growing. I mean, I, I when it comes to tech stocks, I really have a question I ask myself every single day. And it's just, if this company disappeared tomorrow, would anybody care? And it's funny because if you do that every single day, you can really predict everything very accurately, right? Even, even where RIM share price has gone, where where palms went in the trajectory. And yeah. I mean, if Apple disappeared tomorrow, would people care? Yes. If, if you know, palm disappeared tomorrow and you asked yourself that question a year ago, would anybody care? You start to see these answers. And Derek and Rim, Yeah, and, and the, thing that's, the, the thing with RIM share price is if you asked that question two and a half years ago, the answer was absolutely yes. Yeah. But every day that yes gets a little bit quieter because, you know, we found replacements and enterprises adopting, you know, Bring your own device to work is getting supported, like, which is a really scary thing for for Rim in that question. But yes, sorry, Apple stock. I think the numbers will be good, and they'll keep being good for quite a while. Yeah, I, uh, Apple's uh, their price to earnings uh, multiple right now is it's up now considerably, considering yeah. their stock has gone up. But it still is low compared, to, like Google. Yeah. And Google's profit versus revenue is so much lower than Apple's. Uh, Apple's, th their, uh, 
The, the stock the, is he, emotional, not just like in. I mean, yeah. Microsoft has been suppressed <laughs> and, and for so long. Stock is a gauge of the health of the company. When you go in to buy an iPhone or buy an iP iPad, you aren't thinking about Apple stock unless you go and you look at this and go, you know, what? I should buy some Apple stock. I could buy an iPad or a share of Apple. Yeah, <laughs> uh, people, they. they uh, Wow, I lost my train of thought. I'm gonna just <laughs> I'm gonna transition us to one last topic before we go because people have been asking about it. Phil, Google Drive announced today. Should I switch from my Dropboxes? Should uh, Jay switch from his SkyDrive? Um, what's is Dropbox this a big deal? Not unless everybody you know is using it already. Um, look, it's it's really not so much a separate storage service like Dropbox or SkyDrive or any of them. It it really is built in. It's actually absorbed uh, Google Docs, which is kind of a big deal. Um, mm -hmm. and it's going to work in tandem with all that. Now, it does have a desktop component and shows up like a folder, and you can drag and drop things in there and, and make folders and stuff. So it's interesting. I mean, we're three hours into it, so I'm not going to uh, call that one just yet. <laughs> what, you're, like, and you're a blogger? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's an interesting point coming back to ecosystem, right? Like Google's a company where if we came back to Derek's focus, 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 and, you know, do you need to build out all your services or, or services where you can work with others? You know, Phil, earlier today, we were kind of saying, well, you know, Dropbox, like, I love, I use Google Docs. I'm a huge Google user of all their services. But for whatever reason, like, Dropbox is my thing. And even if Google has a competitor, I'm probably committed to Dropbox for the foreseeable future still. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd have been exactly like the same. Kind of like Facebook not reason. overriding Google Plus for a lot of people, too. Yeah, the only reason, to, I think, to switch from Dropbox, Dropbox's user experience is fantastic. It all just works. The only reason to switch from it is the storage restrictions uh, that, you know, you can you can recommend friends, of course, or buy around it. But the only reason that anyone, I think, would move away from Dropbox is if you're going to have suddenly so much more storage or if they can... I don't even know how you can improve these services. I, I, if, someone, if I had that idea, I'd be rich, but it just I works. I think Google Drive's uh, terms of service could use some improvement. Oh, but that happens all the time. It's... Uh, they don't, <laughs> Everyone copies a boilerplate terms of service, and the internet explodes, and they go, wait, wait, yeah. this is just so that we do, you don't <laughs> sue us, okay? Well, they should, they, they should, you know, this is, Google Drive is a big launch for Google. They're trying to pivot more and more into some enterprise service support. Well, you know, they've got Google Apps, and having this storage support to go along with it is very much going to help Google Apps. When you tell your tech department and your, uh, your chief counsel that, hey, I want to see if we can switch over to Google Drive and... Tech, your council pulls up the Google Drive Terms of Service and says, when you upload or otherwise submit content to our services, you give Google and those we work with a worldwide license to use, host, copy, reproduce, modify, create derivative works, such as those resulting from translations, adapt, adaptations, or other <laughs> changes we make so that your content works better with our services. Communicate, publish, public, publicly perform, Breathe. display, and distribute such content. <laughs> <Period>. <laughs> So right now, according to their terms of service, anything you put up there, Google can do whatever with they want. Uh, and sure, that makes sense for Picasa or for Google+. Plus, For something like Google Drive, it, this is that focus. They need to... Google's, you know, they've historically put things out in practically beta. Gmail was not beta for how long? 13.7 years. Yes, and we all still loved it. Uh, if they're trying to do more of this enterprise service support and trying to be taken more seriously as a company instead of being, you know, a company that makes fun but great things versus a company that makes useful and great things. They have to focus on these sort of things and take care of that minutia. Well, Dropbox that, got in a bunch of trouble a while ago when they updated their terms of service again. I think it's just something that companies don't vet through humans before they put it online. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and vetting through humans is very important. I mean, that's what... Uh, you know, Steve Jobs was very good at was he was the ultimate human vetter. Well, he would also throw the phone at your head if it didn't scroll smoothly. <laughs> right. That's uh, a vetting process right there. See, for, for me, Google, it's not going to be an and or. I'm just going to very neatly add Google to my to my list. So I'm going to use iCloud, Dropbox, and now I'm going to use Google as well because I can never have enough free online storage. SkyDrive. <clears throat> SkyDrive. Yeah, SkyDrive. Whoever's going to give me free storage, as long as they're a reputable company, I'm taking it. I mean, I'm going to have if redundancy used, on top of redundancy. If you've used SkyDrive before, you know, they're offering you 25 gig of free space. That's a lot of space. That's a lot of space. That's it's seven back. if you're a new please, user. Please, but... please, please come back. Uh, all right, guys. <laughs> it so is a good service. I'm going to start wrapping us up. Kevin, oh, wait, are we not going to talk about the new uh, the Mozilla phone? Is there a Mozilla phone today? There isn't. Uh... <laughs> no, it was announced a couple of days ago, and it'll maybe come out in two years, but I just thought it'd be funny. I don't need a Gecko phone, quite frankly. <laughs> you don't need a Gecko phone? No. 
All right, we'll put that on the list for a future podcast. Kevin, what's the uh, what's the BlackBerry DevCon attack plan? So I'm flying up there on Friday. We got Adam and Blaze coming in and Chris Umi coming in on Sunday. Uh, Monday morning, I think, you know, this is kind of a typically press day, so things will go hard uh, through the week. It'll be good. And Lots it, of stuff. There's a rumor you're not going to cut your hair until you have a BlackBerry 10 device. That is completely <laughs> true. I'm just letting it grow. Maybe I won't shave either. I don't know. I'm just going to let it you grow. You should probably I shave. You should shave because it's going to take so long you're going to have your beard wrestling in the microphone. We won't be able to tell you yeah. and Jerry Hildenbrand apart. So just the hair. I'm going to keep the hair growing, but I'll shave once every two weeks. All right. And uh, Phil, what's what's on your agenda? You said you have some Sammy thing. I will be in London on Wednesday and Thursday. We got live coverage on Thursday of the new uh, Samsung stuff, Galaxy S3 or whatever it's going to be. I don't know. Um, uh, So we've got that. We've got CTIA the week after, which is a big deal. Do you ever get to sleep? What? Do you ever get to sleep? I you can sleep on the flight. <laughs> you can sleep on the flight. That's true. Yeah, I'll sleep on the plane back. <laughs> no, there's Wi-Fi on the plane. He can't sleep. No, not internationally. <laughs> oh, okay. Thank goodness. Um, Derek, I don't have the sound of crickets chirping ready to go, so... My current plans are to curl up in the corner with a bottle of gin. <laughs> nice. Uh, no, we, we really don't have anything coming up. I'm sitting around waiting on the open WebOS roadmap and seeing what amazing new things I don't understand come out. Well, uh, we'll see if Stallman picks you over Google. That'll give you the boost you need. Yes. Simon, how about you? Uh, well, this afternoon I'm going to be posting uh, my best free iPhone games uh, story. I've been working on that all week, chewing through whatever the App Store's got to offer. And there's a lot there. You know, there's I've, I've found a lot of really good games, ones that I've just never heard of. And you were at the uh, Gamer Con- Convention in Boston last week, too. Yeah, yeah, PAX East. That was that was a lot of fun. There were some really good uh, developers there, and uh, a couple that I didn't even get to see either. That I you know saw afterwards. It's like, oh damn, I totally missed those guys at the show. But it was really busy. Um, uh, lots of really good stuff there. Uh, and uh, like uh, that was my second year at the show, and I actually noticed that uh, mobile was a much more pronounced presence. Uh, the, the, this, this go around, it was kind of like every single booth had some kind of iPhone or Android game there. So. That was uh, that was good to see. Awesome. Jay, are we waiting on the Xbox phone still? <laughs> the Xbox phone's a myth. It's never going to happen. That's what they said uh, about Google Drive, sir. <laughs> no, it's going to be uh, it'll probably be quite a quiet week actually for us, which will make a nice change. We'll carry on talking about Skype problems and uh, maybe playing a bit of Wordament, which is of course an awesome game which is coming out this week. Uh, it's going to be quite a quiet week. I think I'll just end up developing most of the week, um, which is good. I need nice. my sleep. And we are well, still I might, waiting. I might try and find uh, Phil for a beer. Oh, I'll be around. Yeah. Good stuff. We are Welcome still waiting that. on Apple to announce WWDC 2012. Um, it's supposedly maybe going to be in June, but they have not deigned to tell us. Maybe they'll announce it the you know May 30th or something, and we'll have three minutes to get a hotel room. Uh, and maybe we'll see an iOS 6 there. I'm not sure. Will it sell out as quickly as Google I/O? Uh, I think la- I think last year it sold out. A little faster, but I think they have less. I don't know how it works because their tickets are so. How, how expensive are Google I/O tickets this year, Phil? Nine hundred. The Apple oh. tickets. Are, the Apple tickets are a couple thousand. So oh. it's, uh, yeah, it's a different. Oh. It's a different demo. Um, and lots of people go who don't have tickets because they can do a lot of stuff there anyway. Um, alrighty then, Kevin Mitchell, sir. Where can we find out more about you? Crackberry.com and Twitter at Crackberry Kevin. I'm even on Google Plus these days. You can find me. Google them. Google them. Phil? Google me. <laughs> um, uh, Phil Nickinson on Twitter, Phil Nickinson on Google+, Phil Nickinson in real life. When you say Google me, it sounds dirty. <laughs> I, I Googled myself. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> Derek Kessler? You can find me on WebOS Nation. You can also find me on Twitter as DKDSGN. Uh, and you can find me down at the local Quickie Mart with a guitar and an upside down bowler hat. Thank you. Yeah, so much again. What 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 does DSGN stand for? Design. Design. Very well Nothing. done. Okay. I didn't know if it was something deep space. Derek Kessler else. design. He's an artiste. Bazing. Bazing. Bazinga. <laughs> Simon, where can we find out more about you? 
Uh, I'm on Twitter, Simon Sage, and I'm uh, writing on iMore these days, although uh, I technically can write on any of the sites, so uh, every once in a while I might be popping into Android Central or Trackberry or wherever else. Sweet. Jay? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at J-A-Y-T Bennett. Uh, you can Google me if that's your thing. Um, we can Bing you. Can find, you can Bing me if you like. You can, both the search engines I come up, which makes me happy. That's uh, not and of course, I'll be, I'll be around WP Central as well, writing the occasional post and generally doing whatever Dan whips and tells me to do. That is the uh, singularly best graphic I've ever done, I think, on the old WP or WM Experts, WP Central, was the original Bing graphic. Yes. The picture of Bing Crosby saying, let me Bing that for you. <laughs> <laughs> That was almost as good as the signature Phil Nickinson smoke by Windows phone graphic they ran a couple of weeks ago. That was a beautiful picture. I awesome. love that. Um, and you can find me at Rene Ritchie. You can find me on iMor or on Mobile Nations. You can find all of us at mobilenations.com slash shows. We have the Crackberry podcast, the Android Central podcast, once in a while, Derek Danes to do a Palmcast, uh, WP Central podcast, and all the rest. If you haven't already, go to iTunes immediately, leave a review, leave a rating, uh, go to your podcatcher of choice, tell them that this is the best podcast in the damn universe. Phil will agree with that at some point in a written essay somewhere Damn um, it. <laughs> other than that thank you everybody for uh, joining us this has been a mobile nations podcast Woo! kevin out you get to do it this time. actually phil should do it this time kevin out uh, <laughs> <laughs> no you gotta hit your desk till everything shakes you didn't do it right i, I have a glass desk and a whole bunch of phones on it oh i gotta <laughs> drink some more apple kool-aid after talking to all you people <laughs>